Hey guys, Ranger James Pratt here. Uh, I'm at the site of Pigeon Hill. It's the first of two main attacks to the Confederate line during the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain on June 27, 1864. Uh, this is a really uh, amazing spot here. Uh, what ended up happening was we've got the 63rd Georgia, right where we're standing, seven companies of Georgia troops, green troops. They had never seen combat before. And up over the road behind us, if you look, we have an entire brigade that comes around sweeping to try and attack them. This is going to be six full regiments, roughly about 6,000 troops versus about 700, give or take, including the 83rd Indiana. And Private Smollett would, be, would have been part of that particular regiment. He would have fought here on that day at this location where we're standing at right now. Now, again, these troops are really, really green. Uh, they waited until uh, the Union forces were just about 10 feet in front of them before they opened fire. And by that time, the Union troops had already stormed their earthworks. The fighting broke down to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. It was really brutal stuff. And the 63rd Georgia was actually turned around. Whiteburn's brigade, while he was here, including the 83rd Indiana, they would have then made a flanking motion across this field that you see in front of us. We don't call it a battlefield for nothing. You'll be seeing a lot of fields today. In and around to the area just over the, the road there. And that itself is Pigeon Hill. Now as they were trying to assault that hill, it's a rough climb. There's lots of rocks. The Confederates were well dug in behind these natural barriers and they kept getting hit with uh, cannon fire and musket fire. It was just impossible to carry those works to make their way up that hill. Uh, the fighting lasted for about an hour and a half in this particular area uh, before the Union Army thought it was best just to hunker down, wait for nightfall, and then slip back to the safety of their camps. Now overall, uh, even though this was a Confederate victory, this was a Union defeat uh, that cost the lives of over 600 uh, Union soldiers at this area right here where the where the uh, where the 83rd Indiana fought this was a very small Union victory in a sea of catastrophe that we're going to be talking about today and in fact if you look across the way you might not be able to see it with the camera but we have a monument that's erected to the US Army uh, and that's in memoriam of the victory of the small victory and of the sacrifices of those men that fought here so, next up, we'll be traveling down to Cheatham Hill, which is the site of the heaviest fighting, uh, the costliest bit of the battle there, uh, to a place called the Dead Angle. See you then. Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, Ranger Jake again. So right now, you've seen the faint attack at the base of Big Kennesaw Mountain. Ranger James took you through the journey of the 83rd Indiana and the perilous journey of the 63rd Georgia at Pigeon Hill. And now we're at the site of the, of the second, well, yeah, the second and easily most brutal frontal assault by Union forces on Confederate lines that day, June 27, 1864. We are close to the site of Cheatham Hill. So we're going to break this because this was a pretty important part of the battle. We're going to kind of break it into two parts. I'm going to go over kind of the Confederate defense a little bit, and we're going to walk you up to the actual uh, salient or the dead angle itself. And Ranger James is going to take over and talk to you about the Union assault. So, without any further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. So behind me is a, the remains of an artillery placement. Okay, this is towards the back end of the Confederate earthworks. Under the tutelage, or I say the tutelage, under the guidance and leadership of Generals Cheatham, uh, the Major General Hardy, and then General Benjamin Cheatham and Patrick Claiborne. Confederate forces dig in here on the 27th, well, a little bit before the 27th, and they start readying themselves for bear. They know that there's going to be a huge assault on this line. They have ideas. They see people running, it's a union running back and forth and they're under constant artillery fire. Okay, But Cheatham and Claiborne are smart and they are planning ahead. Okay, So one of the things they do is they place their cannons on their flanks to protect their backs. Okay, And they camouflage them. So when the Union is firing artillery onto this position, Cheatham and Claiborne order them not to return fire. And we'll talk about why in just a minute. So we're going to go ahead and take kind of a walk down the line here. And you'll see, again, you'll see a really steep, this is really well-preserved artillery position here. You can kind of see, right now it just looks like a hill. 
but we see a slight dips at the top of that hill there. And what that did was that allowed the cannon to shoot out from it, but the, the big hills, now right now it's like a very low dip, but back then there would have been big mounds, and those mounds actually protected the men and the cannon behind there. So the cannon would have been firing out this way. Those are 12-pound um, Napoleons. Those are smoothbore cannon, had a range of about a mile. But right here, the Confederates had an idea things were going to get really nasty really soon. So they had these loaded up for canister. So as we step over here, we start to see some of the meat of the deeper Confederate trench lines. Okay. Now, most of the Confederates were holed up back here, but this isn't where it stopped. What they did, ex in expecting a frontal assault, we're going to see in a big field in a minute. There's a sign back there that said field fortifications. One of the things that Cheatham and Claiborne decided to do was to build massive field fortifications. So at the top of this hill, you have the Confederates dug in, but all along the hill, you have several layers of, you have two layers. One, a huge brush pot, okay, chained together. Second, was huge, looks like jacks or X's, big uh, timbers jabbed into each other to make huge cross ties so that attacking infantry had to climb through this stuff. Very effective in slowing people down and allowing the Confederates to pick them up. You can see over the top of this trench line here, the intricate interweavings of these earthworks here. This is very complex and at the time would have been very deep. Okay? Estimates and diagrams show that these trenches here were about 10 feet deep, okay, and all along these sides. So where we see just ridges now were headlocks, okay? And what headlocks were was a very effective defensive mechanism. It was one log laid out that would cover a man's face, small, kind of like Lincoln logs, small space in between, and on top of that another log to cover the head. That allowed the Confederate soldiers to very effectively and safely shoot out from under them, but be protected from incoming fire, okay? Now, as we're walking, and Ranger James is going to get to that in a minute, but you'll see, as on this side of the trail, you're going to see a few blue signs, okay? Keep this in mind. This was surrounded by Union soldiers. Frontal assault made it up to this point, and this Confederate defensive position was swamped. Now, that's where we get to our uh, cannon. So, if you remember, just a minute ago, I mentioned that the cannons were being camouflaged and were not to return fire. That way, the Union did not know where the Confederate cannons were or how many they had. They were loaded with something called canister, which is like a massive shotgun round. And when the Union made it up here, they were ordered to hold fire until they were 100 yards out. And that is devastating at close range. Some soldiers have described it as being a fine pink mist. So the Union assault here was very brutal and very violent. We're almost to the angle itself. Now the reason that this part of the earthworks, so this part of the earthworks is called Cheatham Hill for the for Benjamin Cheatham, who was the Confederate general who fortified it and defended it. And the section of Cheatham Hill that gets a lot of talk when we talk about the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain is the dead angle. And what we'll see is, if you see just up ahead, we'll see our Illinois monument, and we'll see a curve of the earthworks. Now what the dead angle means is yes, there were there was a lot of death here on the 27th. But the dead angle was actually a kind of blind spot that when the Union soldiers made it up to that point, it was the Confederate soldiers were not able, they couldn't see them. So the safest place was for them to lay down right on the earthworks. The crossfire couldn't get to them in that one section. It was dead air or dead space. Okay. Now, this is a good spot for me to kind of wrap up my portion of this talk. But again, just to kind of uh, review, we are sitting at the dead angle at Cheatham Hill. What we're seeing here is the remains of the Confederate earthworks that they dug in. These would have been very deep, heavily fortified trenches and flanking and going off into the field, which will be in just a second, were heavy field fortifications. So we're going to clip the video here, and when you pick back up, Ranger James is going to talk to you a little bit about the Union assault and tell you kind of how it shook out here. Okay? So we'll see you in a minute. Hey guys, Ranger James back uh, here at the base of Cheatham Hill, and we're going to be talking about the Union assault. You heard from Ranger Jake sort of the defenses that the Union Army would have been up against at this time. Uh, there were five brigades 
that were launched at this particular position, we're going to be really focusing on one of those, and that is going to be the brigade of Dan McCook. He's 29 years old. He's from Ohio, <clears throat> and uh, he is going to be headed straight for the center of the dead angle. Now, before the attack, in order to inspire his troops, he recites a poem from a guy named Thomas McCullough that was written in 1842 called Horatio at the Gates. And it goes something like this. It's really bolster you up and get you ready to fight somebody. It goes, uh, out spake brave Horatius, the captain of the gate. To every man upon this earth, death cometh soon or late. And how can man die better than by facing fearful odds for the ashes of your fathers and the temples of your gods? So with that, the order to charge was given these guys had to cross over 400 yards up over open field. Now the field that we're in today, this is only about a third of the size it would have been during the time of the battle, so just keep that in mind. They would have had to fight their way up this really steep incline with the sun in their eyes, hot lead coming down on them, and then make their way up to the top of the hill. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing right now. So if you want to follow me. We make our way up. And again, this would have been in the middle of the summer. One of the Confederates up top, his name is uh, Sam Watkins, he describes it as being about 110 degrees in the shade at the time of this particular fight. Dan McCook's brigade gets to about here, right at about 70 yards away from the main Confederate line. That's when those two cannon that were hidden that Ranger Jake was mentioning opens fire on them with canister, completely obliterates the army. Yet still, they press on. They make it actually up to the earthworks themselves. Dan McCook is standing on top of one of the headlocks with his sword drawn, saying, uh, surrender you cowards. As you can imagine, the Confederates don't like that too much. They fire a bullet, hits him in the chest, he falls backwards into the arms of his soldiers, who then take him back to the field hospital in the rear, where July 17th, 1864, he's actually gonna succumb of his wounds and die. Now, a guy named Oscar Harmon then takes command of the brigade, but he is soon struck in the head by a mini ball and immediately dies, and the, the attack just completely falls apart. But unlike at Pigeon Hill, where the Union soldiers wait till dark and then move back to their camps, the Union soldiers here, they don't want to give up this ground. So as Ranger Jake was mentioning, the reason why this is called the dead angle is, well, there were a lot of dead here, but also because of this area right below the Confederate works. If you're looking from the works themselves, there's a lot of dead space here. You can't see what's on the other side of this hill. So the Union Army digs into the side of this hill. They use their hands, they use their cups to dig in, get as low into the ground as possible so they're not getting shot. And they're gonna stay here for a whole week. Now, on July 2nd, 1864, 
Joseph Johnson gives up the position, but not before the Union troops that are here devise a plan to try and dig a tunnel underneath the earthworks. Their plan is on July 4th, 1864, they're gonna have some fireworks. They're gonna blow up the dead angle. They're gonna make another attack, but they don't need to at that point. On July 3rd, they wake up in the middle of the morning here at the dead angle, 30 yards away from the Confederate line, realizing that that line has been abandoned for what Joseph Johnson, the Confederate commander, believes is a more defensible position along the Chattahoochee River. Now, behind me, we have the Illinois Monument. And this monument was a dedication to the troops who fought, and many of them died here. Uh, as far as casualty rates is concerned, for the Union Army, there are about 1,600 casualties in this area, this stretch of land. It's the costliest battle of during the, Kennes the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain. It's also the costliest battle, a uh, single assault during the entire Atlanta campaign. It's also the last time that General Sherman will ever order his men to attack an enemy from the front. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed these little series of videos and I hope that you learned something here about Kennesaw Mountain. And it was a pleasure doing this for you guys. So thank you very much. Thank you guys very much. And thank you, Mr. Pratt. We hope you guys have a good school year and hope things are going okay up there in Greensburg. Thanks guys.